Oh hey there, Dave Hunt here, owner of Game Masters Guild. Hey, welcome back to another episode of The Art of the Master. In this episode, we're going to take a look at metagaming. Why it's bad, and also, why I think metagaming probably isn't as bad as you think it is. So stick around, and let's check out metagaming. So, just what is metagaming anyways? Well, metagaming is simply when a player substitutes his character's knowledge with his own personal knowledge of the game. Now, what are some examples of this exactly? Well, first of all, we have, quite simply, the statistics in the monster manual. So if a player were to open up a monster manual while he's at the table and use that knowledge as his character's personal knowledge, that's metagaming. Or, if a player has even without the monster manual, has intimate knowledge of a certain monster. That also, too, is metagaming if he uses it as his character's knowledge and his character wouldn't normally have that knowledge. Another example of metagaming is, let's say you're running a certain published campaign, and then one of the players goes out and buys that same book. Then he reads ahead to see what's coming up, to see what riddles there are, and to see what enemies they may encounter. That, and he uses that knowledge as his character's knowledge. That also is metagaming. Now, why is metagaming bad? Well, DMs generally regard metagaming as bad because it provides the player's character with an unfair advantage. Now, in a way, if he shares it with all the other players at the table, is it really bad? Well, yes, because... Now the game isn't as challenging or as fun because he's using this meta-knowledge to help his character, as well as the other characters, to get through the game more easily. Let's say they're fighting a certain kind of monster. Uh, we'll just use a Beholder as an example. Now, normally, when they come across a Beholder and, let's say, combat takes place, they're not going to know exactly how many hit points that Beholder has. But if a player has intimate knowledge of a Beholder and exactly how many hit points he could potentially have, then they can tell whether or not they need to keep pushing through and finish the fight or exactly when to retreat. Now, by having this knowledge, it prevents the players from deciding to do unconventional things or to perhaps, say, negotiate or perhaps to fall back instead of push forward. And so this can kind of unbalanced the game, and it ends up exposing more of the mechanics of the game than anything else, and takes some of the fun out of the game. It takes, certainly takes the mystery out of the game. Metagaming can be particularly frustrating for DMs trying to run a game. You've got players looking forward in a campaign, see what's coming up, or you got players who just pull out a monster manual at the drop of a hat just to see the stats. Now, many times, I don't think this is a big problem, but I know it is a problem. Although, on the upshot, I have seen players actually address a DM before and say, hey, I have knowledge of beholders, and I'm trying to separate it from what my character knows. Is there any way I can make a skill check to see if my character knows what I know about beholders? And that right there, I appreciate that. And even when I'm playing in a game myself, I try to separate the meta-knowledge that I have from the game I might take more chances with my character, or I might attempt unconventional solutions like trying to negotiate with a monster when we probably should just fight it instead, or try different tactics, or a lot of times what I'll do, especially with I'm, if I'm playing in a group with more inexperienced players, I'll try to hang back more and just do some basic attacks, and then as other players get in trouble, I might push myself a little harder and then kind of help them out a little bit try to uh, hold back just a little bit and try to work around my meta knowledge. Maybe cast different spells. Like if I know a certain creature is, let's say, immune to fire or resistance to fire, maybe I'll use that spell once or twice. And then I'll maybe I'll say, oh man, he seems to be immune or not as, as uh, doesn't seem to be as harmed by that spell as I previously thought. I think I'm going to try something else. So I, I try to... I try to pretend like my character really doesn't know, even though I know. And that can be difficult to do when you're playing a game, when you have meta-knowledge. What's another good example of meta-knowledge or meta-gaming? Ah, I know. 
that's referencing something that you don't have access to. So I have had plenty of games before where players have been crawling around in a dungeon and one player and they're, and they're, and they're in separate spots of the dungeon and one player looks over to another and says, hey, uh, let me see the map for a second. I'm not sure where I'm at. I got to remember where such and such is. And one player and the other player goes to hand him the map and I say, wait a minute. Who has the map? Who actually has the map in game? Well, I have the map. Okay. And where are you in relation to the other character who wants to reference the map? Oh, we're in completely different chambers. Sorry, you can't reference that map. I'll totally put the brakes on that and stop that right there. Yeah, it's not the pl and, and it's not that the players are trying to cheat. They're just not thinking about where their characters are in relation to each other. And, you know, you see it right there at the table. Hey, can I see that for a second? It just happens. I've done it. Tons of people have done it. It's not a big deal, but you definitely want to put the brakes on that. Now, sometimes, well, you just have a looser night than others. You're like, yeah, I don't care. Look at the map. You kind of remember it's a smaller dungeon, so you kind of remember all the twists and turns. It just, it just kind of depends on what your game calls for. So, metagaming overall can generally be bad because it can derail your encounters. It can derail the structure of your campaign, and it can basically take the fun away from other players as well as yourself and kind of defeat the purpose of playing a role-playing game at least i feel so that's all about that's all about who knows what and then it's all about the bonuses and the numbers and then a lot of that other stuff kind of goes out the window which i don't like because a role-playing game is about role-playing and also too it's a fantasy game you know there should be danger and excitement and mystery and when you have all these reference materials sometimes it's not that's not very it's, it's not fun sometimes it, metagaming kind of takes the fun out of it so now let's move on to the next part just how do you fight metagaming well first of all i won't let players blatantly reference either a campaign that i'm running if i'm running a published module i won't let them reference it at the table and i certainly won't let them reference the monster manual at the table absolutely not and I try to encourage everybody at the table to not use metagaming, or I try to remind them, oh, that's something your character wouldn't normally know. You're going to have to give me a skill check for that. And usually, that's just plenty right there. Give me a skill check for that. Not a problem. Now, what about instances where players, I don't know, let's say they look at me and say, well, Dave, you know, we've been wailing on this thing. He did 50 points. I did 50 points. That guy did 40 points over there to it. These guys did 20 points each on their attack. He, yeah, he should almost be dead, right? I'll look at them and say, hmm, you know what? Your character does think that. You know, the creature should almost be dead. And actually, maybe I'll reference it. Take a look at the monster. Hmm. Yeah, actually, that monster should be dead by now. It should be. Why don't you give me a skill check? Oh, no. So right there, a player calls me out at the table talking about the stats of a monster. And then I don't necessarily throw it back at him, but I take that, I repackage it, and then I present it as another mystery. Like, well, yeah, it, it should be dead. And that's what troubles your player. Your, and that's what troubles your character. So why don't you give me a skill check and we'll find out. Oh, no. Is, some, is it something different? Well, in fantasy, it could be anything. Remember, everything in a role-playing game, every rule, every monster entry, every part of a published campaign that you're running, their guidelines, their suggestions. If you don't have anything, go with it. But if you need to modify it to make the game more fun, more interesting, or more mysterious, well, then by all means, do it. Plus, also, this keeps your players guessing and it helps prevent some of the metagaming. Add more hit points on that monster if you need to. Give him a higher AC if you need to. Now you should have this kind of stuff pre-planned out ahead of time, so you're not doing it literally right in the middle of combat. But, you know, just think about this stuff sometimes. And by a little extra forethought, you can combat metagaming pretty easy within your game. Okay, so I've generally looked at why metagaming can be bad and why most DMs can't stand metagaming, and why it can upset the balance of your game. And I did briefly mention how you can kind of quickly work around metagaming. Now, 
I'm going to tell you that you shouldn't stress about metagaming. And I got to tell you, I think metagaming can actually be good. And I don't mind it so much. Why is that? Well, first of all, I'm the dungeon master. So what if a player knows a stat block for a monster? Even if he's got a photographic memory, it doesn't matter. It's all down to the dice roll and how many monsters there are. Oh, sure, if they're they're fighting one bandit on a street corner, yeah, they got him. But what if I got a beholder and he's got a couple gazers and he's got a couple other minions? Sure, it's more work on you, but the more bad guys you put out there, the less players are worrying about the stats and they're just trying to save their skins because there's more opponents. It's definitely a lot different when your players are fighting more opponents versus just one monster. And I've seen it, you've seen it, we've all seen it before. It's a lot easier for four or five players to work over one powerful monster than it is for four or five players to fight four or five other mediocre monsters because there's a lot of back and forth, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of different things happening in combat, it ends up being very dynamic. And that's one of the things right there, dynamic combat, the more stuff you have there, the more you're moving around. Sure, it's more work on you as a DM, but the more interesting your combat is, the more stuff you put in there, your players aren't going to be quite as worried about the stats as they are about getting their characters moving around the board and trying to avoid damage. I mean, they're always worried about this kind of stuff, but that's just something to remember. And with metagaming, for players who know all the stat blocks for all the monsters, well, to me, knowing that knowledge actually represents the character's years of growing up and the knowledge he's accumulated over the th over that time. Now, I won't let players blatantly reference the monster manual at the table unless I let them make a skill check and I sp explicitly say, hey, you can reference the monster manual for this particular monster for this encounter. That's okay. But generally, I won't let them crack the monster manual open at all at the table because it's unnecessary. They don't need to. But if a player knows, oh, I know trolls are affected by fire. Okay. And, I mean, let's look at it. In a fantasy setting, trolls, your players are going to hear about all these fabulous creatures. Trolls, dragons, beholders, maybe doppelgangers. They're going to hear all these stories. And they're going to hear these stories from, you know, the family members as they're growing up, from other adventures they talk to, or just people in general that they meet. They'll have a discussion and they'll hear, oh, did you still hear so-and-so killed a, a dragon outside of town? Or somebody found a doppelganger the other day. And that right there, that bit of information over the years, slowly becomes the player's knowledge. It's just like you driving a car today. Sure, you can't, most people can't pull the engine and rebuild it from scratch. But when I get in the car and drive it, especially nowadays, I've been doing it so long, if I have a flat tire, I need to change the tire, I can do it. If I need to change the air filter, I can do it. I can change the oil. You know, if I have some, if I have an electronics problem, I know it's probably a fuse and it's not too hard to look in the fuse box and see which fuses are blown out. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I can do with my car that I've heard from other people over the years about how to fix and what to look out for that's built up my knowledge. It's just like when I go in the kitchen and I make myself something to eat. It's not because I went to a school about cooking or how to become a chef. I just, over the years, I've seen other people make sandwiches. Or I've heard from other people how they prepare things. Or I just take the box of stroganoff out of the cabinet and read the directions. You know, eventually you're going to develop this kind of knowledge. Just through familiarity or hearing other people and asking people questions. Now, here's another thing. Is that knowledge always going to be accurate? Nah, that's why they have a median number in the monster manual for hit points, man. So I'll frequently max that out or I'll lower it as I see fit. And that helps out as well as immunities, vulnerabilities, uh, resistances, attacks. I, as Dungeon Master, I totally feel free to modify any of these at my whim. Now, I try not to take the core essence of the creature and totally destroy it, unless I'm trying to make a completely different creature. But I will definitely modify these things, lowering and raising hit points in AC, as I see fit to give the players 
a different challenge or unique experience at lower level. You know, why would a beholder only have like, I don't know, 50 hit points or, or 25 hit points? I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason. Maybe it's been in a battle recently. Maybe when it got thought dreamt in, or thought dreamt into existence, maybe it wasn't quite complete. So it's this little raggedy looking thing that just manages to live until the players encounter it and they fight it and they dispatch it. You know, there's all sorts of weird possibilities you could do and weird excuses you could give other than it's just like, oh, look, standard beholder, go fight it. You know, give your players a different experience because I got to tell you, your players are second level and they all run into a beholder. They're going to freak out and they're going to think, oh, we're done. And if that beholder, you know, sees how afraid they are, it's going to chase them because it's going to think, oh, these guys, I'm a beholder and, and these little puny humans are too frightened of me. Ah, I'm going to destroy them. But they come to find out when the players fight it and it's got all these weak eye beams because if it's a little runt, if it's a little runt of a beholder and, and can't really do anything, maybe it's got just weak eye beams and maybe there's no disintegration ray. You know, maybe half the eye beams don't work and the other half are really lame low level spells. Why not? Why not? Well, it's not what it says in the monster manual. Oh, so there's only one type of beholder in the monster manual. Yeah, okay, whatever. You know, it's a fantasy world, man. Get fantastic with it. That way, you don't have to worry so much about the metagame. And I gotta tell you, even if a player does have a monster manual open, and they can look at all the stats and figure it out, it doesn't matter because it's all down to the roll of the dice. Did you make your saving throw? Oh, look, it's got a plus 10 to hit. Oh, you're doomed. <laughs> you know, oh, look, it's got friends. You know, as Dungeon Master, you shouldn't be so afraid about meta knowledge because some of this meta knowledge is good. Remember... Meta knowledge replaces the characters. It, it gives the characters knowledge of the world that they're in. So meta meta gaming is kind of okay in certain instances. Instances. Now, I'm not I'm not gonna let players who are separated in a cavern freely swap one map back and forth between them because it's just not physically possible. But if it's a small enough dungeon, I might say, well, look. It's really not a big thing. Here, we'll just draw it out. This is the dungeon. You can get in and out. It's no problem. But if I'm trying to conceal the dungeon from them and it's big enough, well, yeah, surely. I'm going to say, well, you don't remember exactly which way you came. you got to figure it out, you know? So so I just, I just don't worry about metagaming that much. Even during combat, when players freely talk amongst themselves and try to figure out the best ways to combat a creature... I don't think this is too bad either, especially when other players point out other player, other characters' abilities and, hey, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that. That's okay, too, because I think if you were really a cleric or a fighter or a paladin or, or a wizard, you would know these things automatically. These things would be second nature. But here, you're having people in our real world playing fantasy characters who have already spent part of their life becoming those classes and then going out in the world and fighting these dangerous monsters on these dangerous quests and adventures i mean it's kind of a kind of a knowledge gap there you know so ease up a little bit it's okay now i won't let another player run over another player and say look this is what you have to do you need to move here and hit him with this ability right now this is what you need to do i won't let another player tell another player what his character should do i'll shut that right down you know, I'll try to be polite about it during game. Say, hey, look, look, let him, let him run his character, you know. Sit over there. I know. You just got to take a breath. Let him run his character and decide what he wants to do. And I'll even tell that, you know, I even tell a player, say, look, you know, he said uh, he had a good idea about maybe using this. But also, don't forget, you got all these other options you can do. So go ahead and just tell me what you want your character to do. And if it becomes a big problem, well, I'll have, I'll have a nice conversation with that other player who wants to dominate other players in the game and tell them what to do because you just don't want that because it takes away the fun from that other person when someone else tries to tell them exactly what they need to do in an encounter. I usually don't have much of a problem with players looking ahead in any kind of published campaigns I'm running because, well, I homebrew a lot of stuff. So it's hard for players to really know what I'm going to put out there. That's why I like homebrewing stuff. Not to necessarily purposely make it difficult for players, but 
to really keep it open-ended so a player can really turn left if he wants to turn left or keep going straight if he really wants to go straight. Or the players want to split the party, more power to them. So I don't believe metagaming is really that bad. It can be difficult if you are a brand new dungeon master and your players are fairly experienced. That can be kind of a catch-up game there for you and it can be frustrating until you get some sessions under your belt and you start feeling more comfortable and seeing really quite how malleable the game is and quite how easily you can change things to make it more fun and more entertaining and combat this extra meta knowledge that the players have. And plus also, it's just nice to sit down and communicate with people if you have issues or concerns. And that's the big thing. It's just talking. Sometimes people don't even realize what they're doing until you bring it up. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. You always want to be polite. And a lot of times it's nice to do this not in front of a bunch of other people. But if you need to address one or two people, I wouldn't necessarily do it at the table. But I would definitely do it maybe in private, in between sessions. That way there's, you know, no one feels like they're outed right there at the table or, or singled out. You don't definitely don't want to do that. You don't want them to feel bad or you don't want to embarrass them. So you always want to think about that when talking to people about metagaming and using knowledge from outside the game. Now, if metagaming is a problem at your table, well, simply at the beginning of each session, make sure to let players know that they can't reference things such as a published campaign that you're already running or the monster manual. That way they have to rely on whatever knowledge they happen to know. And then also too, keep a few extra monsters in your back pocket especially in a published campaign. Let's say someone's read ahead or they've already ran that particular campaign, let's say last week. And whether or not, inten whether or not it's, in it's intentional, they remember what's coming up. So keep a few extra monsters in your pocket that maybe wasn't in the campaign and substitute some monsters that are in the campaign for monsters that aren't. That way, it kind of keeps players on their toes and makes the game a little bit easier for you and more mysterious for them. Well, this is kind of a shorter episode. I kind of felt like I owed everyone a shorter episode of the Art of the Master just because my last few just kept getting longer and longer and longer. <laughs> so this episode, I tried to shorten it up for you all so that way it wouldn't be quite so uh, lengthy to go through. Although, I'm definitely going to be making some more longer ones in the future. So I hope you like this episode of The Art of the Master, a quick look at metagaming. And I really think, even though there are some negative aspects to it, I really don't think metagaming is really that terrible at all. And especially once you get some experience under your belt, you can work around metagaming like nobody's business. I walk circles around it all day long. Even if I'm running a published campaign, metagaming isn't a problem. And that comes with experience. So... If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave it in the comment section down below, and I'll definitely take a look at that and respond as quickly as I can. And also, if you have any ideas for any other future videos, be sure to leave that in the comments as well, too. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Art of the Master, and again, I'm David Hunt, telling you to stay safe, play great games, and I'll see you real soon.